This is Jennifer Walden, and you are listening to the A Sound Effect Podcast. Joining me to talk about their sound editing on Bradley Cooper's Maestro are Oscar-winning supervising sound editor, sound designer Richard King at Warner Brothers Post-Production Creative Services in Burbank, and executive music producer and supervising music editor Jason Reuter. Richard has won four Oscar awards and earned eight nominations with two of those nominations for the 2024 Oscars, one nomination for Best Sound on Maestro and another for Oppenheimer. This is Jason's second Oscar nomination, and both of his Oscar noms were earned on Bradley Cooper's films, the first one being a nomination for Best Sound Mixing on A Star is Born. Here we talk about capturing live music on set, editing the music to fit tricky scenes like Leonard Bernstein's piano duo with Aaron Copland, how the sound effects and design were used in a musical and emotional way, and much more. Kawaii UI by Rogue Waves is a delightful collection of charming, rounded user interface sounds designed to be cute. Vintage Mechanical Keyboards by Missile Goose captures the nostalgic sound of seven unique sounding mechanical keyboards. Neighbors, Sounds Behind Walls by Fennec FX captures the daily activities of neighbors living next door or above you. Big Screen Trailers by NI Sound is a collection of 520 carefully designed sounds to take your trailers to another level. Whistles of Vintage Steam Locomotives by White Crow Sound Production contain seven steam locomotive whistles from the beginning of last century. Good afternoon. Good morning. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Jennifer. Hi, it's so nice to talk to you again. So I guess let's start from the top since this is such a music driven film. Jason, as the executive music producer and the supervising music editor, when did you get involved with this film and what were some of your responsibilities early on? Oh, gosh, we started started talking with Bradley five years ago on the final dub of Star is Born. And he already kind of had some references in mind. There's a 73 video archive by Humphrey Burton that, that we all sort of studied and looked at the Ely Cathedral performance and started coming up with the concept to do it all live back then. So from that point, it was, how are we going to pull this off? What studio is willing to do it? You know, because it's kind of such a risk. And, uh, and then it was just kind of a long prep phase. We kind of dove into prep and then COVID stopped us for a bit. So we, we kind of moved a year. We kind of kept working creatively to some extent through the pause. It was it was a lot of script revisions and music choices and how many performances were we going to ultimately go with? You know, Bradley wanted more of a, a film about marriage, not not necessarily a musical biopic. So it, it goes back years, really. Wow. So you decided that you wanted to capture these orchestral performances live? Yeah. I mean, Bradley was very adamant about it. You know, on Star is Born, we did a lot of all the vocals were live and yeah. some of the instruments and things like that so we all found just comes off so much more authentic if you do it that way he was like let's just do this with full orchestra and uh it was exciting to hear him really fight for that and is that ultimately what happened were these performances all captured live so everything you see visually was recorded live the pieces that play more score choices those obviously were recorded 
at air like a session but yeah everything on camera was live wow interesting so i had read a story in screen rant about leonard bernstein playing the piano he's actually playing alongside aaron copeland so in the screen rant it said so he and his co-star really were playing the song but a much better version was played over the scene instead so can you talk about your music editing on that scene like what did it take to get the better version to match up with what we see so it was it, it ended up being hybrid we took kind of a lot that was offset and then we just sort of tweaked it you know there were some notes that we just kind of had to recapture and kind of crop in and put them together but that was kind of one of the more challenging scenes music editorially just because you had two actors at the same piano so it took a little bit of doing <laughs> yeah i bet and they don't fake it like it's not like a hey here's their hands and then here's their faces it's actually like a side shot and you see them playing so yeah it must have been tough yeah yeah they they both practice they they both went for it which was great to see them pull it off and so for the orchestral performances, gosh, I hope you didn't throw all that on the production sound mixer. Was there someone else there helping to capture the orchestral performances and choirs and things like that on set? Yeah, definitely. So Ely Cathedral was pretty complicated. We we went over and did a tech scout. We kind of fought hard to get the LSO on the project, just kind of the choice orchestra for the piece. The concept of the music it really wasn't produced like a film score, so to speak, where, you know, you kind of go in and stripe everything and you have kind of close mics on all the instruments. We, we really wanted this immersive performance feeling like you were really sitting there. So after a lot of thought and, and change of plans, kind of leaned into the LSO. They're kind of based out of the Barbican. So I got in touch with the technical people they use because they're super familiar with the LSO, you know, all the players, they've done some broadcast things out of the Barbican and that sort of thing. So, and it turned out two of their engineers had actually recorded at Ely Cathedral. So we enlisted them really quick. It was sort of great to find a classical engineering crew that both worked with the LSO and Ely specifically. So that was great. I mean, there were some things that we didn't expect, you know, they, they don't really use Pro Tools. They kind of work on Pyramix and it's very different setup, but we sort of came up with a really good plan, you know, and they, they were kind of new to, you know, Bradley wanted a cable cam kind of running through it, which kind of foiled our plan a little bit for miking, but uh, we, we got around it. We slung a lot of mics from the ceiling. We had a couple in frame that sort of matched the 73 archive. So it was trying to keep it as authentic as we could to the references we had. And did that create any problems in post? So you record everything, it sounds great, but then you take it back and you're trying to edit it to picture. And now you, you know, you don't have discrete instruments to like pan here and, and pan there. Did that cause any issues in the post process? You know, I mean, it, I, I have to say it, there's a little bit of luck and magic involved because, you know, Bradley got the one shot, which was pretty incredible. It's interesting with RX and things, you can do a lot of cleaning and, you know, set noise and things that you pick up. You can kind of get that stuff out. There's pretty minor comping and trickery, actually. It's a, it's a pretty clean recording. So I think uh, something was on our side to kind of get through it. <laughs> the Coast of Bernstein. Yeah. <laughs> I would like to say that it took all this, you know, incredible Pro Tools work and all that, but it, it was really... I mean, it was very challenging to mic, but, but we did a tech scout everything was in the prep trying to pull everything together and you know it worked out we had a couple crash and burns out of the gate i think the you know the chorus had a hard time because they wanted a rehearsal for that space in particular because they were super concerned about the reverb and everything and we kind of ran out of time we weren't able to, to provide that for them so it, it took all the players and the chorus members a little bit of time to adjust but we we got it done in a day awesome so the opening of the film is uh, Leonard Bernstein playing the piano in his house for a film crew. And there's a boom op like right there in frame. So was that a real boom op capturing Cooper's performance? I mean, why not? Right? Yeah. I mean, we had mics in the piano, the boom mic, Steve Morrow would have to answer that question. I'm, I'm pretty sure that was used for his dialogue and everything. Got it. Awesome. Uh, so Richard, on to you. So when did you get started on this film and what were some of the first tasks that you had to tackle? Uh, I started in about February. You know, the picture had been cut together. There was a good cut of the film. So I was invited out to Bradley's house along with Jason and the mixers and some other people to watch the film. And um, I was just finishing up Oppenheimer. So I 
started a couple of editors on on Maestro to get that going. We had a spotting session early on with Bradley, literally going through the film in real time and talking about mood and feeling and not so much specific stuff, but more uh, kind of what he was going for on a grander scale. And then we set about working. And it was quite an evolutionary process in that it is a music movie. So the sound design really needed to act in that same vein and not call itself out or not be too obvious. For instance, all the scene transitions are very smooth. There's no abrupt change when we go to a different location. Yet we wanted each location to have its own distinct personality. You know, there are two homes uh, in Connecticut and in Long Island and Tanglewood, New York City. So each of these places had to have its own kind of vibe and personality, as well as altering a bit depending on what's happening within the scene, using either uh, birds or wind or the natural elements that were available to us to use in the scene. Bradley really wanted to use wind as a motif. So we were very concise in our use of winds and didn't use any kind of airs or anything like that. It was really just using using sound effects. I want to say like the movies of the 30s and 40s and 50s even, uh, where a sound effect happened, it had a specific purpose, and it wasn't just wallpapering the film with sound effects, but rather each sound had its own reason to be there other than visually there was also an emotional component to that so that was a bit of a, a evolutionary process to get the to get the sounds of the real world i guess the characters are interacting with to sit in with the flow of the music for the black and white scenes did you take a different sonic approach than you did for the scenes that were in color no, ultimately, we didn't. We tried some things. You know, we thought, well, the visuals are different. I mean, they make a very strong distinction between time frames. So maybe we should do something with sound akin to that, like either bring in the sound field a little bit, or um, at one point, we were thinking about running different kind of backgrounds for the two different looks of the film. But ultimately, we found that that was too much of an on-the-nose reaction to what we were seeing. We didn't really need to do that. And, and in fact, it was distracting. Interesting, because you're talking about bringing the sound, you know, in for the black and white scenes. But I was kind of wondering, like, if you made them more colorful, <laughs> like took a more colorful sonic approach. I guess the birds in the black and white section in particular were extremely cheerful, like they're having this uh, serious <laughs> conversation and the birds are just like so delighted to be there. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, the birds were a big uh, discussion, big point of um, experimentation, like trying different things, different varieties, different amounts, different levels. Different cheerfulness. <laughs> different cheerfulness. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Not too many crows. I, I think that's an example of the birds being a, uh, a counterpoint to what's happening in the scene. Um, a counterpoint or support what's happening in the scene. So there really wasn't any like spatial distinctions made between the black and white color footage sonically or anything like that. Got it. Okay. So it's not like, okay, this is black and white. So here are the hard and fast rules that we're going to. Yeah. No, we, we, we tried everything. I think we tried literally everything. <laughs> so that was definitely on the table for a while. But ultimately, you know, when you live with a film and you you see it over and over again, you really start to become sensitive to certain things and realize that the film sort of ultimately tells you what direction you should go with decisions like that. And ultimately, it just seemed like that's not what the movie's about. The movie's about what's happening on screen in that moment. And um, we didn't feel like we need to resort to that kind of trickery to accentuate the differences of the time frame. One of the things that really stood out for me um, with the sound editorial were the crowds, the different size crowds and like the party crowds and the performance crowds. Um, so can you talk about how you built uh, the different crowds for the film? I loved how chaotic and like energetic the party crowds were. There's so much talking everywhere from like every direction. <laughs> yeah, well, the, the theater crowds were composed of crowds in my library, basically. This was sort of the end of, of the second or third post-COVID phase where you really couldn't get crowds together or it was, it was difficult. Uh and there weren't a lot of crowds actually on production, except for a few scenes. And we used every bit of production sound that we had for those. But the parties, those are all production recordings. Steve Morrow mic'd every actor in the scene, and they're all having real conversations. 
that allowed us on the mixing stage to dig out a certain phrase that Bradley wanted to hear or, you know, make the overall busier. Or when you did actually hear a line from a party goer in the background, it was that actor saying something that was part of a longer conversation. It wasn't a a random uh, loop grouper just babbling. Fascinating. It, it was much like the old Robert Altman approach to mixing groups of people in that it could be, the scene could be composed in a number of different ways, depending on how you wanted to play it, because it was all that material was discrete. And I think it works so much better because the little snippets of conversation that you overhear are clearly part of a bigger, longer conversation. And you really have the feeling like you're kind of eavesdropping as you might at a party, walking through a party, just hear bits and pieces of random dialogue from those actors. I love that. Was all of that scripted or were they just given like a, an outline like, okay, so you're here, just talk about this, have a conversation about this? Yeah, yeah, some of it was scripted. And obviously there's a dramatic through line of um, going from Felicia to Leonard to the daughter to Jamie and, and to his agent. And those lines were scripted. Some of the background people's lines were scripted, but most of them were, were just, they literally had a party. And, That's awesome. and they, and so they engage, you know, engaged in conversations and, yeah, it just has a great natural feel. It'd be very hard to recreate, I think, in post. Yeah, that's amazing. So a lot of dialogue editing, I guess, on this film. A lot of dialogue editing. <laughs> a lot of dialogue editing. Because sometimes, obviously, you'd hear the same person from multiple microphones. So it was uh, tricky for dialogue editing and for dialogue mixing. Uh, Thomas Anish did a great job with composing that party scene using, you know, perspective. And after Tony Martinez, who was the dialogue supervisor, had carefully cleaned out overlaps of dialogue and same line for multiple microphones. Because they were all, you know, it was a small-ish space. So yeah. uh, everything sort of picking up everything else to a certain extent. But with really careful dialogue editing, Tony did an amazing job on that. And um, kind of almost musical mixing of wanting to hear a phrase and then wanting to hear a little bit of that phrase and wanting to build up the volume of everybody so you don't really hear anybody, but you hear everybody talking at once. And yeah, I asked Bradley if he had modulated any of the background voices while either Leonard or Felicia were talking. And he said, no, they're just at a party. He created a party vibe on set. And I think that lends those party scenes such a, a vibrant, um, alive, fun quality. Yeah, definitely. That's absolutely what I took away from is like, wow, <laughs> it feels so real. So well, that's why. That's, that's awesome. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so uh, if you had to pick one scene from the film that kind of best represents your sound work, what scene would that be and why? Gee, I don't know. I, I think there's a number of moments. I think it's really, the goal was to make it very seamless and unobtrusive, I guess. Uh, I love the scenes in their Connecticut house because there's so much life in the backgrounds and the wind and the birds and the vibrancy of that. I think those scenes sound really alive to me. There's just kind of a cheery vibe, I think, that we were able to come up with eventually with uh, the combination of all the sounds. Whereas the Long Island house was much more subdued, uh, more blue jays and crows, and the Connecticut house, where they had their happiest times, were kind of more cheerful. And those huge trees they had in the yard were the wind was always blowing. And um, yeah, I love the I love the backgrounds. I love the way the backgrounds finally ended up which was a matter of really refining, taking out a lot, a lot of weeding, just to come up with the the bare bones without too much of like plastering the walls with sound so that every sound had an impact or had a point for it. And the first time I saw the film and hearing Bradley talk about it, I had that realization that that's what he was after. He wanted each sound to have a purpose to be there, not just to be there for its own sake or be there to fill a void or anything. It was really about having every sound make a point and have a reason to be in the film. Yeah, really intentional editing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I got to say, just it was like watching these guys composed it. I mean, if the winds were strings, so to speak, and the birds were piano, to me, it's that sophisticated. You guys dove in that deep. Yeah. We tried to get in the spirit of, of the music and really wanted to honor it and fill in the places between musical pieces with sounds that didn't pull you out of that musical mood that you were in. And what about you, Jason? If you had to pick one scene from the film that best represents your sound work, what would that scene be and why? I, I mean, I guess I would have to say Ely Cathedral just because the amount of work and 
insanity that went along with it. It was just kind of, it was amazing to be a part of. I mean, it was just, it was amazing to watch on the day when we shot it. I'd never experienced anything like that between the players and Bradley and camera and the soloist. It, it was just, it was unbelievable. Yeah. Listening back, you know, the hairs on my arms were standing up. So I can't even imagine what it must have been like to be in that space and, and hearing that actually happening live. Yeah. It, even Bradley turned around and just said, this is the most amazing day I've ever had in my life as an actor. Just the energy in the room was just great. So that was all of my questions. Was there anything else that you guys wanted to talk about that I didn't cover? I want to ask Jason a question. Yeah. <laughs> so, so Eddie Like Cathedral, was every mic recorded to a distinct, uh, a discrete track? Yeah. Yeah. We took everything down to a discrete track in Pyramix. And then I had Classic Sound, who were the guys that the LSO use. Um, they sort of did like a little bit of a live board mix. And then we, we did a split off that into Pro Tools. So we had two systems running. So if we had to do any editing or play anything back, we could do some quick comping in Pro Tools. But yeah, it was 60 something discrete tracks. Did those eventually wind up in Pro Tools? Those discrete tracks? Yeah. Yeah. We transferred them over. They were. We really didn't get into too much editing on set. I mean, we just checked a lot of takes back and made sure we kind of had things for noise. We did some real quick RXing and things on the spot to make sure, you know, there were a couple camera moves. So we were like, just make sure we can get this out. Do we have to do it again? That kind of thing. So we transferred all the takes over to Pro Tools and then just brought it back home. Mm, that's an amazing scene. It's probably my favorite scene in the film. It is quite amazing. It really is. Like the choral parts in it, the orchestral parts, like ah, it works so beautifully together. It's just stunning. And Bradley's so good. That's just a really moving scene. Was he actually perspiring or did they have to hose him down? Like <laughs> <laughs> I, I think he, I would say he was definitely, I, I think he started that day. He started his day at 2 a.m. for Yikes. a nine o'clock roll. He had a full five hours in hair and makeup to get ready to do the scene. So that's commitment. <laughs> commitment and probably a lot of coffee yeah yeah awesome well thank you guys so much for doing this interview with me thanks jennifer thanks appreciate it thank you guys bye, bye. bye. looking for more audio related podcasts to listen to we're part of the audio podcast alliance featuring a hand-picked selection of the very best podcast about sound be sure to hear the latest episodes from our friends in the community at audiopodcast.org that's it for this episode thanks a lot for listening and see you next time Take care.